Hume grew up on a dairy farm, and he's an agricultural engineer. He has worked with farmers his entire career, mostly in, in Niagara. He's semi-retired, uh, but he's an auditor for Ontario's Grape and Wine Sustainability Program. And he also consults um, between farmers and non-farmers next door. In 2019, Hugh self-published Swing Bean Barns of Niagara, stories of 50 barns built in Ontario, Pirica, 1819 to 1884. Hugh lives in St. Catharines with his wife, Judith. And by the way, Judith spoke to us several years ago about dementia. Some of you may remember when she was here. He's also a director with a new organization called Ontario Barn Preservation. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you, Bob. Can you hear me okay in the back there? I normally speak fairly loudly, but uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. And for those people uh, online, uh, hopefully you can hear me as well. Uh, I'm going to pass around a uh, display copy of my book so you get a chance to see what, what it looks like. I'm not doing a hard sell on them or anything, but uh, take a look at it. Scribble your name in it if you want. I don't care, uh, but it's a display uh, copy. Now, I was going to ask, first of all, how many of you either grew up on a farm or were maybe had a connection to a farm or maybe uh, your grandparents? Yeah, so quite a few of you. So this is... Little, then you can ah, see. now they can see me. Yeah, perfect. So uh, throw those hands up again. Yeah, so that's quite a few for a crowd like this. Lots of crowds that you'll stand in front of. Maybe one person will put their put their hand up. The connection of people to farms today is is uh, sadly um, uh, few and far between. So good on you. So you have some good memories of of, uh, of farms. Um, I'm going to, uh, after the presentation, I'm going to be selling books at the back there, and I have a model of a, uh, of a, of a swing bean barn back there, and I realized when I got here that I forgot one important piece of that uh, barn, and that's the base. So it's really wobbly back there, so don't, don't start playing with it or anything like that. I don't want you to get hurt. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to jump into it. I always tell people how many slides I have before a presentation so they know when you're getting to the end in case your head's starting to hit the table because you're bored or you're half asleep. I have 33 slides here, and you're going to see a, a bit of a trend in the, uh, in the slides here. Everything on each of these slides has to do with the number three. So isn't that coincidental that I have 33 slides? So hidden in plain sight. So that's a picture of uh, my license plate. If any of you uh, are in the, in the parking lot, when you uh, leave today, you'll see old barns. There's a bit of a story behind that, but I get lots of looks from people. And that thing that I am sitting on in that picture is, is called the swing bike beam. And this is in a barn that I bet every single one of you in this room has driven by uh, on the way to Dunville. It's on Highway 3. It's on the north side. If you've driven to Dunville, you've driven by this barn, and you'll never know where it is, and you'll never know why it is so old. This barn probably built in the 1830s. So there's three reasons why I wrote this book. First of all, I've worked with farmers my entire career, so it just seems like something that you would do. That's me up on the right side there at 12 years old, uh, walking on uh, our dairy barn's uh, beams. Don't ask me why that I did that, but uh, I did. And then at 15, for some unknown reason, um, I took the bus down to... Uh, to Toronto, and I took a photo of this 
which is Ontario's oldest barn at Black Creek Pioneer Village. I'm sure some of you have been there. Maybe you've even seen this barn. This barn was built in 1809 or 1808. It's one of the oldest, if not the oldest barn. So it kind of looks like my destiny. I show this picture in my book because I've taken another picture of the same barn from the same location just for, for reference. And I only took about three pictures on that whole trip, but one of them was of the barn. Three reactions when people see my book. First of all, anybody of the guys that I used to go to school with or played hockey with, first one there is, you're kidding. You wrote this book. They just can't even imagine that I could write a book. They just couldn't imagine. And I couldn't imagine I'd ever done that either. So that's, that's the first one. The second one is, is uh, this book is better than I imagined. And that, that uh, gentleman right there is actually a, a senator in Ottawa. I used to work with him. He lives up in the Elora area and he wanted my book. So he sent me a picture of him looking at it. And then a former uh, colleague at the bottom there, uh, he says, well, finally, I know what this strange tool is. I don't know if you can see that little device uh, beside him, but he's from a farm and that's called a flail. And that was used, uh, been used for thousands of years to actually uh, uh, thrash uh, wheat, grains and other, other things like that. And I'll be showing a picture about that a little bit later. Three reasons why swing beam barns were built. First of all, they were built to store wheat and other grains. Um, secondly, they were built to sell wheat and to get hard to find cash. Back in the 1800s, early 1800s, it was very difficult. There wasn't much cash around. Uh, people did a lot of bartering. Uh, we didn't even have our own money yet, uh, in the early days when these barns were built. We had to rely on British money, American money, Spanish, uh, you name it. And so this was a way to get cash. Wheat was actually worth more in those days than it is today in today's dollars. So I don't know if any of you know what the price of wheat is, uh, but uh, it's probably less than $10 a bushel. And in those days, uh, in today's dollars, it was worth over $30 a bushel. It was worth a lot. You, you could get more for a bushel of wheat than, than you could get in wages for a whole day. So it was valuable. And then third, you could make flour out of it, make bread, and, and uh, so you needed it to eat. So it was hugely important. So three features that make swing beam barns different. And so if you look at that uh, schematic there, the swing beam is that little purple thing. Okay, if you can see it up there, it's this little thing right here. It runs across the barn. It's clear span. It runs from one side of the barn to the other. There's no posts underneath it. Okay, so it's like an open concept type of a barn. It'd be like this room. This room's an open concept. There's no no beams across, no posts or anything in the way. So it gave you lots of room to, to work. They were often tapered uh, thicker in the center than they were at the ends. And I'm gonna show pictures of that. It's almost always the biggest beam in the barn. Beams run uh, across, posts run up and down vertically. And they were always seven feet off the floor with very few exceptions, seven feet off the floor. I guess they never expected anybody to grow that, that tall. Uh, people were a lot shorter in those days, but it was really so you could actually put a horse underneath there. I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in a second. And so that's why a swing beam barn is so much different. So why was it called a swing beam? There's nothing swinging, nothing like that. Most people think, oh, I had to swing around, no. So after unhitching your horses, if I show you right here, after, un so you, this is looking down from the sky on the barn. So after you drove into the threshing floor area with your horses and wagon, you could unhitch the horses and they could actually swing around underneath the swing beam and back out behind the, behind the wagon. 
It's almost impossible to uh, back up a wagon with horses. Not impossible, but it's hard to do. And so they just unhitched the wagon uh, and the horses would be uh, led back out. Second reason is you could swing a flail. This is the flail. And uh, you could swing a flail uh, there, lots of room. And uh, basically, we're beating the tar out of the uh, out of the wheat or oats or barley or just about any any grain to get the seeds off of the stock, and that was called uh, flailing. And you would swing a, a flail to do that. And then finally, some farmers would swing their horses around like a merry-go-round around a little post that was put uh, in the center of the barn underneath the swing beam. And they walk around in a circle, thrashing the wheat or other grains under their feet. They take their their horseshoes off, and they would uh, thrash the wheat. Now, I've never seen this occurring anywhere, uh, but there's references to it uh, in the literature. And in fact, uh, a barn that's going to be in my next book uh, from the Welland area has a little a little um, leather strap that's still sitting on the swing beam and it spins around and I know that's what it was used for. It's magical to find those kinds of things when you are investigating these books, these marks. And that's half the fun of writing a book is doing the investigation and the hunt for these, these barns. So three groups who built swing beam barns. Uh, Mennonite immigrants uh, in the early 1800s from New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So lots of them, they came up uh, from the States. Uh, and United Empire Loyalists, they were all escaping the turmoil down in the States uh, after the War of Independence, American War of Independence, and then the, uh, the War of 1812. They came up here um, and, and they built these barns. They brought the technology with them. These barns were already built in uh, New Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania and, and other areas, but Ontario now seems to have the most of these barns of anywhere. And they're kind of unique. They, well, they are unique to North America, and now they're almost unique to Ontario because with, we have the most of them. They don't appear, to my knowledge, anywhere else across Canada. And then the third group were the English immigrants in the 1830s, uh, English uh, and Scots, and they learned the unique to, to North American technology when they, they got here. So there's three reasons why there were big trees here to make these big swing beams in the first place. First of all, uh, the neutral uh, Indians uh, were admired by the Europeans for their farming skills in Niagara. They were farmers, uh, but through war and disease and famine, uh, they disappeared from Niagara around 1650. And then after 1650, all those areas that had been farmed by them and other areas, they uh, rewilded, okay? They went feral again. There was nobody here for 150 years, really nobody here between about 1650 to 1800. And so the trees started to grow uh, and they grew to tremendous sizes until the Mennonites and the uh, United Empire Loyalists arrived. So when they showed up here, some of you, it would have been some of your ancestors. I have United Empire Loyalist um, ancestors, uh, but they all settled down in lower Canada, Quebec, that's where I'm from. Uh, but the, the, uh, in Ontario, uh, the trees just started growing. And there were, you can imagine how big trees could grow after 150 years. And some of the white pines that were here in Niagara, were four feet in diameter and bigger. Just imagine the size of those trees. And some of the trees that are in some of these swing beam barns, when you look at the size of the beams, the biggest one I've ever seen, I've ever seen is 27 inches deep. So that's about like that. Um, there are reports of beams being even bigger than that, three feet, 40 inches, 42 inches. I've seen pictures of some of these beams. To get a, a beam like that out of a tree, you would need to have 
a tree that was probably close to 200 years old. And considering they were cut down around 1825 or whatever, some of these trees uh, started to grow in the 1600s. So pretty amazing. And so that bottom picture, I took that picture at that old barn. That is a pine board that is 48 inches wide. Okay, so imagine a 48 inch wide piece. That's, that's my little binder sitting on the floor beside it, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. And look how wide that, be, that barn board is, amazing. Should be in a museum. So I say finding a swing beam in a big barn like this is like finding a dinosaur bone. I also think it's like finding a mammoth tusk. And it's also like finding a passenger pigeon, uh, all of them extinct. Um, so when you find a swing beam in a barn of a tremendous size, it's like finding those things in my opinion, uh, because we're never ever going to see trees of that size again, unless we all get wiped off the face of the planet. Uh, in the next uh, number of years. And uh, sometimes that seems like it's gonna happen. But uh, in any case, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these things are, uh, they're rare and they should be admired. And it's a shame to see barns get knocked down that, that, that contain these things. By the way, passenger pigeons uh, were, uh, went extinct around 1914. The skies were black with them here when they first, uh, settlers came here in the 1800s, and they basically hunted them to extinction. They say that 25%, 25% of all of the birds in the sky in Eastern North America back in those days were passenger pigeons. There were that many. The skies were black. They, they couldn't, it was like hearing water go over Niagara Falls uh, when a flock of them went over. There's a report of, of, a, of a flock of passenger pigeons flying over Lake Ontario that was 80 miles long, 80 miles long. Just imagine that. And they were just like flying chickens for the uh, settlers. And they just, they just, they didn't even realize they were, they were hunting them all to extinction. And the same thing happened in the States. So three things occurred in just, one generation, in my opinion, from about 1815 to 1840. First of all, if you were to be able to go back in time and stand around in Niagara, you would have found that the skies were black with not only passenger pigeons, but also smoke uh, from cutting and burning extra trees. Uh, I wish they could have left a few of them here so we still could admire these beautiful uh, uh, trees, but in, in those days, and you don't, can't blame the, the early settlers, they, uh, the, the, the forests were considered the enemy when they came here uh, from the, the States and from overseas. They had to get rid of those trees because they were the enemy. They, they, they could be fires around your buildings. There were wild animals in there. Uh, and, and they were between you and, and growing something that you could uh, eat and save your family. Uh, so that's, that was one thing. Secondly, if you were to climb a tree up near Brock, okay, a big tree up in Brock, and you looked around, you'd probably find at least 25 barns going up in all directions, maybe more. They were going up so fast, uh, it would make your head shake. They couldn't get them up fast enough, and so uh, they were going up all over the place. And the third thing is that the population here in, in Upper Canada uh, which is now Ontario, tripled from 150,000 to 450,000 people in just 25 years. Now, 150,000 doesn't sound like very many, uh, and even 450 doesn't sound like very many, because that's kind of what the population of the greater Niagara area is now, uh, including Hamilton. Uh, but, uh, you know, when the first barns were being built here, there were literally only a few thousand people here in Niagara. Three reasons why we have so many here. First of all, the United Empire Loyalists brought this new technology up from the States. And so this was the first 
real area that they were uh, uh, built in. Um, although I have found them uh, across the province now, but Niagara definitely has the most of them. Um, much of the earliest settled areas like the uh, Greater Toronto area are now urbanized and all the barns are gone. There would have been lots of barns in Toronto, lots of barns in Peel and Halton and uh, around, around Toronto, uh, but there's not one of them left. They're all gone. Um, and then the other thing unique to Niagara is that we had a lot of fruit farms and the fruit farms could use these small barns. And when I say small, a typical swing beam barn was about 30 feet wide and about 50 feet long. And, you know, this room, I'm looking at this room here and I'm thinking this room is probably about maybe 36, maybe 40 feet wide and maybe uh, 50, 60 feet long. So not much, you know, about the size of this room, about the size of this room, maybe a little smaller. And so the fruit farms could, could actually use them. They'd use one end bay to uh, be a holding area for fruit. They would, uh, the threshing floor could be a breezeway where they would uh, pack fruit and the granary be, would become a cold storage maybe in the 40s and 50, 1940s and 1950s. Uh, for those of you who are from farms, are, how many of you are actually from Niagara, grew up in the Niagara area? So a few of you, you'll, you'll recognize, you've probably been on some of these farms uh, and you would see those. And I still see that today because I still work with, uh, uh, with the tender fruit uh, industry and, uh, and in particular grape growers. So there's three cross sections of the majority of barns. I'm not gonna get into the details of each of these, but the oldest barns were very simple barns, very simple barns. They had, just a swing beam, tie beam, and a strut. Very simple. As they got old, they, as the time went on, the barns started to have different cross sections. They were more, uh, the, the trees were getting smaller. They had to put more bracing in them to, to strengthen them up. And then into the 1850s, the barns started to getting a lot of uh, bracing in them because the trees got smaller. And you can almost age a barn, one of these barns, based on the size of its swing beam. Big swing beam, old barn. Small swing beam, young barn, younger barn. So there's three types of swing beams. Uh, first of all, there's some that are uniform in cross section throughout their length. So they might be uh, 14 inches deep, 12 inches wide, 30 feet long. But then there's tapered ones, and the tapered ones are the oldest ones, and they'll be thicker in the center because that's where the most stress is. Um, and they knew that. They didn't know how much the stresses were, but they just knew that it had to be stronger in the center to support itself. And then there's some barns that, that I've uh, noticed now uh, were actually flat in the center, and then they tapered, and I call those brush cut uh, swing beams. And I know that the group here in the room knows what a brush cut is. I don't have to tell any of you. I'm going to say old farts because I'm an old fart too. Uh, but you all know what a, a brush cut is. Almost nobody younger than us knows what a brush cut is. Just about nobody. You ask our kids, they have no idea what a brush cut is. I know every one of you knows what a brush cut is. Uh, three main types of wood used in swing beams. Around here, um, mostly softwoods, mostly white pine, uh, beautiful soft wood. You run your hand on it, it's just beautiful soft. You don't get any slivers, something like that. Uh, then there's hardwoods, and you'll see ash and oak and even walnut. And then I've heard of a, of a barn that's no longer up over in the... Uh, uh, in the St. Thomas area that had a black cherry swing beam in it. Now, you can just imagine uh, how much something like that would be worth today. In fact, swing beams, uh, there's, a, there's a demand for these things. Uh, and we've lost a tremendous amount of barns. And guess where they've all gone? To the States. And they've gone to the States. They've been dismantled and taken down to the States uh, for offices, and houses in particular. 
people love to live in an old barn. I would love to live in an old barn. This, this barn up here um, is actually in the Dundas area. Beautiful, just an incredible barn, incredible barn and incredible swing beam. So three renovations uh, that I've discovered have made swing beam barns hard to spot. First of all, um, all of these swing beam barns that were ever built had a gable shaped roof. And this is a gable roof, like your house. It's a gable, it's just a simple triangle. But those of you who are familiar with barns will know that a lot of barns have a gambrel roof. And this is this double sloped roof that's here. Probably 50% of these old swing beam barns have been turned, were turned into a gambrel roof sometime in their history. Typically around 1890, 1900, 1910. And you say, why did they do that? That was a big job. Why did they do that? Well, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, the roof might have started to uh, rot or it needed some work. And they said, you know what? We're going to do this newfangled thing called a gambrel roof. And many of you will know it as a hip roof. That's not a real hip roof. I'll show you what a hip roof looks like shortly. Uh, but this is actually called a gambrel. They put it up so they could um, have more uh, room for storing hay and they could put a wagon wheel in them. Secondly, all of these barns were built as ground barns. So they were actually built on the ground. The posts were put right on uh, fieldstone piers. They just sat a couple of feet above ground. They had a wooden plank floor. Um, they were cold. But sometime after uh, Canada's uh, Confederation in 1867, the livestock industry started growing up in Ontario. People were living in towns. They needed, uh, they didn't have their own cows anymore. They couldn't get milk. And so the whole livestock industry started around 1875. And so they jacked these barns up and they put a stone wall foundation underneath them. And uh, you'll see that in many cases. So they're hard to recognize as an old barn. And then thirdly, they just get buried under all these old, uh, many other buildings. After a while, you can't even see where they are. But if you know where to hunt for them, and I do know how to hunt for them. I can find those things uh, underneath all the, buried under all these other ones. First of all, uh, then three chances I took when I wrote this book. So I self-published. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever written a book. I'd never written a book before. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I got some help from a lady that uh, attends our church. She'd been in the publishing industry before. Uh, she helped me a lot understand things. But basically, you can self-publish uh, or you can go to a publisher. Now a publisher will tell you, uh, you'll do 90% of the work in any case. You're gonna do 90% of the work regardless if you publish yourself or with a publisher. So you do 90% of the work. But the publisher tells you how high to jump, when to jump, where to jump, what to jump through, and they take 90% of the profit and you get 10% of the profit. Now, the, the, uh, the, uh, the market is smaller, so I don't have as big a market. I don't have the advertising. I've never advertised. I've sold uh, uh, way over 800 books now, which is unusual for a self-published book, but I don't care. I, I, I get to know, I get to see the whites of your eyes, and I know who's, who's bought my book. Um, so I was willing to do that even with a smaller audience. I also spent a fortune on this thing. I won't tell you how much, but I will tell you that um, I spent more on this book than my first house. So I won't tell you, so you kind of know how old I am. So you know how much money I spend on it. And the other thing is I wanted it to be 100% Canadian. Now I could have sent this to China to get printed and that's cheaper. I could have done that. I could have gone to a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a printing house uh, nearby that was uh, cheaper, but I decided I wanted it to be 100% Canadian, and I decided I wanted top quality. Now, those books uh, will last forever because of the binding, because of the paper, because of the way it's stitched, a whole bunch of different things, and that's what I wanted. 
And I didn't know if I was going to sell one copy. So I've been lucky, very lucky. Three things inside that book. So it's been circulating around. There are 50 chapters and there are about 50 barns, almost all in Niagara, not exclusively, but almost all in Niagara. Uh, it's 272 pages long, including a, a, a glossary and a bibliography and index. Now I hired uh, professional editors and they won't let you they won't let you put stuff in there unless you can show and back it up, get a reference. And that was good. And that's tough. It's not easy to, 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 to do all these things. And then it's got uh, over 600 figures, schematics, and tables, and it's very heavy, as you can see. So there's three parts to each chapter. So the first part of every chapter, there's an imagined dialogue that I've created between the barn owner and others, maybe in the family or friends. So it's a foreshadowing story, but it's based on real history. Did the conversations happen? Of course they did not happen. I've imagined that they happened, but they're based on real people. These are all real people in these, uh, in these stories and they're all real events. So basically it's like a Forrest Gump story if you know who Forrest Gump is. So my barn owners participate in and they witness history as it unfolds around them. Then I talk about the technical details of each barn with photos and neat things that I found inside. And then at the end of each chapter, I tell you what actually happened in the future based on the story at the beginning. So that's how each one is laid out. And so I'll give you a a sense of this. So three fun stories that are in the book. One chapter is called The First Falls Photo Barn. I also like to uh, use goofy uh, titles in my books. But this is uh, a barn that was built in 1840. And my barn owner helps take the first ever photo of Niagara Falls. Now, did he? Not likely. But I actually uh, put him in the story and had him help take the first photo, which was taken in 1840 by a British uh, man who owned one of the world's only cameras at the time. 1840 is really early for a photo. And if you look closely in that picture, I circled, I don't know if you've ever, any of you ever seen this picture before, but that's, that's the photographer right there in the picture. Now, how did he get in his own picture? Did my barn owner do it? No, it's because this is a daguerreotype uh, film camera. And um, there was about a, uh, an eight minute exposure time for those things. And you could walk into your own photo as long as you did it quickly and you wouldn't see any blur or anything like that. And then this guy stood there dead still for several minutes while the exposure of the camera was, of the film was working. So he's in his own photo. I call this a selfie, the first selfie ever taken. Uh, somebody scolded me for that. They said, well, that's not a, a selfie. It's supposed to be like this, you know, that's, that's a selfie. Well, yeah, okay, I guess I get you. But anyway, so he, he's in that. The other thing that you'll notice in this, and maybe you can't notice the camera, that picture, uh, when it was taken, it was actually backwards. And it, we've had to uh, uh, invert it because that's the way the karyotype ones were, were taken. The second kind of fun story I call the She Cave Barn. Uh, this is actually on Martin Road out in Vineland. Some of you maybe even know this red barn by the, by the lake. Uh, the owner had four daughters and um, and they teased their brother, and this is real, they did have four, uh, there were four daughters, they teased their brother about their cool refuge in the Barnes root cellar. This root cellar is the most incredible thing I've ever seen at a place. Uh, it's underneath the bridge that goes up to the, uh, to the second, uh, to the loft of the barn. You can't see it from outside. You wouldn't even know it was there. This thing is eight feet high, 14 feet wide, and 28 feet long. It's the biggest, root cellar I've ever seen. And it's a Roman arch uh, stone design. It's just beautiful. Um, the workmanship in there is incredible. 
Um, anyway, beautiful. And then the last one, uh, I call it the blades, the dung and the stick barn, 1839. And so my barn owner uh, plays in the first ever ice hockey game ever played in the world. And most of you will not know that. Montreal thinks they had the first game. Kingston thinks they had the first game. Nova Scotia thinks they had the first game. No, they didn't. It was here in Niagara, 1839. And it's, in a, it's a referenced in a book. Uh, and it was uh, soldiers stationed at Chippewa, just uh, up from Niagara Falls. There were uh, 80 people uh, playing and they, uh, they were using it for exercise. And they were skating on the Chippewa River, the Welland River, and they played the first ice hockey game. And so uh, I put a picture of that, a little hockey stick right there. I met a guy who told me he thinks he owns the oldest hockey stick in the world. He's convinced it is. He's talked to the people at the Hockey Hall of Fame. They don't believe him uh, because they already own what they say is the world's oldest stick and they paid a lot of money for it. And so they don't want to find another stick. So anyway, uh, that's kind of a controversial thing. Anyway, he thinks he has it. It's only 42 inches high. And uh, I put it beside my hockey stick because I still play hockey. Then some serious stories. Um, and so I call this from the foreshadowed forest barn, 1821. The son of a settler who was married to an indigenous wife argues with his mother that cutting all down all the trees is just fine. There's lots of them. God put them there for us. And so there's going to be lots of trees forever. And guess what? There ain't no trees left. Uh, the grumbling stomach barn. Um, a child worries that he might starve again, like in 1816. So this particular barn is up on, uh, I think it's Spring Creek Road up uh, on the way to St. Anne's um, in Niagara. And uh, many people will not know this, but back in 1815, I believe it was, the, what, the world had the biggest volcanic explosion in recorded history occurred down in the South Pacific in 1815. And it spewed so much stuff into the sky that the skies were black around the world. And it caused catastrophic um, crop failures around the world, including Niagara. The temperature dropped three degrees Celsius around the world. Niagara had frost in every single month of the year and there were no crops. And thousands, maybe even millions of people died across the planet and nobody really knew what happened, right? I mean, there wasn't any uh, uh, news, no TVs, no radios, no papers. So nobody knew what, just God was a little pissed off with us. So uh, something bad happened, right? And so, but people starved. People starved all over the place, and including in Niagara. And then the third one there is, I call it the hiding him barn. And uh, it's about a barn owner hiding a runaway slave from the US from bounty hunters. And that did happen uh, back in the 1850s. And so this particular barn is over in the uh, Beamsville area at the Hipple farm, if any of you know uh, Larry Hipple. Beautiful old barn. You know Larry? Some of you. So I asked Larry, and I've known Larry for a long time, and Larry's probably the same age as the average age in this room. And I said, Larry, when was the last time you saw, this is a wagon. This would have been used back in the 1800s for, uh, you know, uh, wheat sheaves, bringing wheat sheaves in. And there's a, there's a wagon rack lifter there that would lift that up in the air. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that shortly. I said, Larry, when was the last time? Because I've never seen it down. It's been up in, the, up in the top of that barn forever. Like he doesn't even remember. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting to see these things. And I've seen a few of these in barns. And some people don't even realize they have. They don't even know what they are. So that's interesting. Three great surprises. 
These are magical to find these things, marriage marks that a master builder would have scribed to identify where timbers fit. If you see these three little marks right here, that's a, uh, this is a, a carpenter mark or a marriage mark they sometimes call. And so that would indicate that that was in the third bent, which is the structural frame that helps hold the barn, one of them. And so that beam would have to fit with a corresponding post that also had three little scribe marks on them. And you see these in older barns, um, but I've seen them in probably a half dozen, maybe, maybe 10 barns. This one here on 7th Street, this is gonna be in my next book. You've all been by it a million times. If you haven't driven on 7th Street, you don't live around uh, this area, but this barn has what I call arithmetic on the granary wall. And it's in dollars and shillings uh, when both were used at the same time around 1850. And so they've had to do some, and I've already figured out what the uh, translation is there. And it's exactly right. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to do the, the math or arithmetic at that time. Uh, finally, this third one at the bottom here, this is a working model of a wagon rack lifter that was used to show farmers how it worked. And the writing on the bottom, which you cannot see there in pencil, says patented 1885. And so the owner of this, it was his great grandfather uh, who would have built this little model. It still works. I've never seen one anywhere else in museums or anything else. It's the only one that I'm aware of exists, still works. He pulled it out of his basement. Um, the fun thing about this is that I, this was in a box, like a great big lunch pail. And I think this guy's great grandfather uh, would um, take this around at night to show farmers what he could build for them. You know, I could build you one of these things for $12, you know, if you'd like. So that's what he did. Three symbols I find in many barns, fertility symbols, these are fertility symbols. When you have a, a diamond shape like that with a dot in the center, I won't get into what that all means, but it's a fertility symbol. Um, rosettes, which are concentric circles uh, to ward off bad luck, usually around the granary. Uh, they were very superstitious people in those days. And then diamond crosses, uh, which are a combination of religious and fire protection. Um, and that's actually the same sort of shape that you see on fireman symbols. They use a Maltese cross for that. And um, again, this barn is, is local. You could see those, those things if you were to get up close to them. I see them on a lot of barns. I also see them on that are hidden. There's not one farmer that I've visited yet who's ever seen these in their own barns when I pointed out to them. They have no idea, they, they've been in there for 50 years, they've never seen these things, and then I show it to them. Now, in my next book, I've also got something that I've never seen before, it's remarkable, and it's an indigenous uh, peace symbol in the end of a barn. And it's two arrows that are crossed, and they're pointing down, and apparently that means it's a peace symbol. Um, and it's remarkable, and it's in a barn up in the Aaron area, and um, the barn's in really tough shape, but you can still make out those arrows. Remarkable. Three barns you will recognize locally. Happy Rolfs is a swing beam barn. Now, it's been changed a lot. It's now got a gamber roof, uh, but, but that barn at Happy Rolfs on the other side of the canal is a swing beam barn. The QEW Antiques Barn, you drive by a million times, a million people go by it every week. That is a swing beam barn. Um, when I visited that barn, I said, boy, you know, and it's a whole bunch of shops inside, right? Now, and the one who owns it is a death trap, <laughs> somebody say that. Anyway, uh, inside there, uh, I said to the guy, I said, you know, this barn was built about 1850. He says, no. No, 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 1905. I said, no, no, it's probably about 1850. He said, no, no, 1905. There is a date on the outside on the, on the uh, 
on the basement wall. And sure enough, there is a little plaque that says 1905. But that's when they jacked the barn up. And so you can get fooled by, by things. There is no way this barn was built in 1905. I also argued with another guy not too far from there. Uh, he just couldn't believe that I would say it was older. He says, not a chance. But anyway. And then Herndur's Winery that burned down a year ago. Uh, probably some of you have been in that. That's an old swing beam barn. It's hard to find it. It's, it's completely, Fred Herndur completely changed the inside of that barn. It doesn't look, it didn't look before it burned down anything like it looked in this picture uh, when it was originally built. In fact, it was running uh, north-south instead of east-west. And I also argued with Fred, but if any of you know Fred, um, he likes to argue. <laughs> anyway, so this barn, I've even, uh, because it's in my book, the insurance company has actually bought some copies because they want to know, I'm probably the only one who actually kind of knows what it looked like inside. And so for insurance reasons, they want to be able to recreate it. Three of my favorite barns. Uh, this was uh, a barn that's uh, in the Vineland area, still up. Uh, the 17 year old grandson of the owner of this barn who built it, drew this picture and it's to scale. It's, it's in the right perspective. Uh, I think he must have drawn it from sitting up in a big pear tree that was nearby. It's just remarkable uh, how the detail a 17 year old kid would have had in those days. Uh, the Bucknell barn in Camden, uh, Jim Bucknell, I don't know if any of you know Jim Bucknell, but uh, remarkable man, he's, and he's got that barn looking great. And then this is a barn in, uh, on Culp Road in Vineland. A beautiful, uh, beautiful barn uh, that I just love. Three non-swing beam barns that everybody locally asks me about. And I know that some of you know these. This is, this is a half, half hip roof barn on Seaburn Road, um, which is uh, just off Merrickville Highway. Yeah, between there and Cadillac Road. Yes, yeah, okay. yes. Know. If you take, you know that nasty uh, S turn on Merrittville Highway where people fly off into the field, you know, at night, um, just turn in there and this barn is right there. It's, it's one of the biggest barns I've ever been in. And I've probably been in at least a couple thousand barns, at least. And this is one of the biggest barns. I couldn't believe the size on this thing. It's in rough shape but it was built in 1885 after swing beam barns were built and I couldn't include it. I wanted to, because everybody asked me about it. Lakeshore Road, I know you all know this one too. Just, uh, just west of Port Dalhousie on Lakeshore Road on the south side, be around Fifth Street, a uh, beautiful barn. I wanted it to be a swing beam barn. It ain't a swing beam barn. Um, so anyway. And then uh, up at Balls Falls, there's a, there, there actually is a barn up there that's a swing beam barn. It's in my book. But uh, this is a great old barn, but again, about 1885 and not a swing beam barn. Three reasons why people say they like my book. They like learning about local history. Here's a little piece that I found in a, uh, that somebody had on all the materials that were in his swing beam barn. And this little unit says J. Wismer, one thick timber. That's the swing beam, $4. That's what it costs, $4. Photos and schematics. Some people love, love the photos and schematics. And then uh, lots of people tell me they just like my stories. Get rid of the photos and everything. Just tell me your stories. They like the stories. So you never know what people are going to like. Um, three best compliments I've gotten about the book. Somebody told me they've decided to fix up their old barn after I showed them what they had. Uh, somebody else show, said, I've, I've, you've showed me things I haven't seen in my barn for in 50 years. And the greatest one was, you know, I'm gonna rip, I was thinking of ripping my barn down and now I'm not going to do it. And I've had that a few times and it's really nice to hear. Three things I'm doing now as a result of the book. 
I'm now a director with uh, a new organization called Ontario Barn Preservation. Um, go on our website. We're trying to find ways to save old barns uh, where possible. And through the Ontario Barn Preservation, I'm now in charge of creating an online tool for owners to record their barns forever in the virtual world. And uh, so I'm actually working with uh, Bob. Where are you, Bob? Where'd you go? Where'd Bob hunt? Bob have, yeah, so Bob, uh, so I've actually met with Zoom. This is the first time I've met Bob in person, I think. Anyway, we've met on Zoom about three times. I've helped uh, Bob recreate his old barn that he remembers as a kid up in the Durham area. And we're getting close to figuring out what it looked like and we're gonna put it on the database. I'm gonna put it on the database so that that barn uh, can be there uh, forever uh, in the virtual world. And then seeing some of these old barns repurposed um, into something. There's a beautiful swing beam barn up in Camden uh, that a, a local contractor, building contractor, has turned into his office. It's just wonderful, wonderful. Um, three ways I've sold my, my self-published book. I've sold it in my driveway. Probably about a third of my books have been sold in my driveway. I've mailed about a third of them around the country and into the States and then a third of my uh, books at presentations. So it's been fun. Three lessons I've learned about writing a book, pay a coach with publishing experience. So I paid the lady at my church to, to help me. Uh, pay experts to uh, edit, design, and print. That was, that was painful paying for it, but uh, it was worth it in the end. And then it's the law to send two books to, uh, to Library and Archives Canada. They, uh, and they don't want to pay for them. You got to send them free, right? So uh, anyway, they sit there forever long after you're gone. Three features in my next book. I'm going further afield, um, mostly on the oldest barns that uh, were uh, pre-1841 for Upper Canada, uh, many different places across the province. I'm going to be showing some more ingenious things I found in barn. Look at the, look at the wooden gears in this barn for a wagon rack lifter. Um, remarkable, <laughs> the, the detail that they spent. This is down in Dunville. And then I'm showing the artistic flair of some of these barns. Some of these, some of the things that I've seen in these barns have nothing to do with structural uh, need, uh, nothing to do with functionality, but they're just artistic. People were just doing that uh, for, because they wanted to. So three ways to contact me. Uh, there's different uh, ways. I'm going to sit around for it. If anybody wants a book, um, they're $65. That includes tax because um, I got to I got to send money to uh, to the government uh, HST. Um, and then I mail them, and they're really heavy, really heavy, and so they cost 22 bucks to mail. I sign every book personally, um, and I and th those are different ways you can uh, you can get them. But because most mm. because most of you live in near St. Catharines. Uh, if you tell me, phone me up, tell me you want one, take my card. Uh, I'll deliver it to you if you live nearby. So I think that is it. Thank you so much. Are there any questions anybody has? Screen share. Yep. Hang on a second. So we'll do a stop share and we'll go back to Come on, back to, no, we won't. Sure. Yeah, we will eventually. Or we're gonna go back to gallery view so we can see who's still there. And if there are questions, if there, if there are questions in the ball, take your hand up and I'll Yeah. Right. The trees would normally be tapered. Why do they taper the swing beam? You know, that's a fantastic question. So the question was, why were, did they taper them? They weren't tapered. I can't answer that. They might as well have just left them um, the way they were. But I think they like symmetry. They like symmetry. That's the and you see that all the time. Symmetry was important to these people. So if it looked this way on one side, it needed to look the same way on the other. When did you start building stables with old barns as opposed to just putting the barns on the ground? They built the original barns on the table. 
So Jim Bucknell's barn was built about 1841, and it does have a, a basement underneath or a stable underneath. So, uh, and there are barns certainly in the States that are older than that with them. But up here, I would say that's probably about as early as they would have been built around 1840. Uh, but they added those stables much, much later, for sure, for sure. Uh, but I would say about 1840. There was no livestock industry here in the early days. It just wasn't. This is the question of system appreciation. Um, you talked about barns and how they will be developed and how they put the stables under. And you helped me figure out something about how our family barn has been built. And to, to understand how it has been developed. And from that, I had a whole new understanding of my grandfather. And, and I appreciate that. My grandmother had said the year after she was married, she put a new stable under the barn. So it all, and that was 1893, I think. Mm -hmm. So that all fits in. So Stu's knowledge is really, really helpful. And I appreciate it ever so much. Good. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. We have a good question on the other side here. It's a little trip. And I'm doing the same thing. So in my next book, I'm actually recreating my family's old barn, which I have not been in since I was 11. But now I know exactly what was in that barn based on old aerial photos and a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Has there been any government intervention in terms of heritage? I mean, there are heritage buildings for all in cities in Ontario. What about the rural areas in Ontario with farmhouses? Yeah. The farmhouses and so on. Yeah, so that's an excellent question, Hugh. I love talking to people with a name of Hugh, right? You just don't get that. We have a we have a connection. Um, that's an excellent question. So, um, so as a director of Ontario Barn Preservation, I can tell you, and talking to farmers, farmers do not like the word heritage because you know what happens when you get heritage designation on something; you can't change anything. So. As a director with uh, Ontario Barn Preservation, our official uh, policy is that we will help people get uh, heritage designation if they so want it, but we we don't advocate for it. It's a tough one. It's a tough one to put a heritage designation on some, but some buildings really do need it because they are so special. But um, having worked with farmers my entire life, uh, first of all, they're fiercely independent. They don't like to be told what to do at all. Uh, yeah, and um, and and um, it's just a and. But the problem with old barns is that they cost money to fix up. And but is there government uh, assistance? No, there is no government assistance uh, for helping you fix up your barn. Unfortunately, I wish there was. But man, there's not, a, there's not enough money in the world to do that. There's still a lot of barns out there. I can certainly speak to that because when our church wanted to replace its slate roof, since it was a heritage building, it had to have a slate roof and it cost a third of a million dollars to put a slate roof on that church. And speaking of you, yes, I always hated my name um, because. <laughs> In a school of 750 boys in England, I was the only few. And can you imagine? And everybody was Peter and Michael and Patrick and all that sort. But I was the only few. And of course, they, they ripped me the law. So I was so special. And, and, and on one occasion, I was in a choir. I was sitting in the, the, the line of posters in a choir. And there were three in a row. I was there in the university, or the different school, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I have no opinion if you call it me. I'm sorry, but uh, yes, and uh, and so yeah, that, that's it. And I wrote the book, and um, there's the a publisher, was uh, a British publisher, but uh, somehow, some in the promotion of the book, they got it all wrong. 
and my name appeared as H U W, which is oh. Welsh. It's a Welsh W. God knows how they did that, but uh, but that's what happened, and uh, so that's another story. I think Hugh needs an intervention, and we're going to have to uh, you know, make a support group or something. Yeah, the Hugh support yeah. group. Yeah, the W. I always hated it too, Hugh. By the way, I always hate it, but I love it now. No problem. One of, one of my uncles uh, was a dairy farmer. Uh, uncle married, married my dad's old one of my dad's older sisters at the far end of Lincoln County, uh, west of like Caster Center and Avenue, where yep. my dad was born. And the thing I recall about one of his farms, he had two farms at 90 degrees to each other, so it attached to these extensions. The one side, the older one, had this wagon lift thing. Okay. And it had an apparatus here that was set up with these bloody great bars with great steel teeth, one circle like this. And it was set up so that they could take and haul a wagon up, just pile, unveiled hay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then lower this apparatus down and put the horse team to it, flip some levers somewhere. And as the horses start to walk away, these claws would close into the load of hay. And we found this with my cousin. I can remember Paul. Oh, this is cool. Like, yeah. We couldn't, we couldn't go anywhere near it. It's way open space. But, and then there was a, so they haul it up, and then it was set up so you could try to, you know, try to down the length of the barn and yep. then release the hay up there. It's, it's, well, yeah, most many of these barns, in fact, that's what one of the reasons why they actually turned these from gable into gambrels so they could put one of those tracks on there. And um, yeah, you see that all the time. And, and even a young guy like me, I can remember uh, uh, using a team of horses to to use that track. Although in our case, in my grandparents' barn, it was small square bales, eight at a time, with little forks that went into them and they'd go straight up and across. And then you drop them 40 feet. And uh, and the bales, the bale, the bales, I don't know if any of you have ever handled small square bales before, but the mow would get so pounded that it was it was like this from the bales landing so much. And it was literally the center would be six to eight feet lower than the sides, which is a little valley there. So. Any other questions or reminiscences about an old barn? Yeah, one back here. There's a guy I even know, Harry Cole. You won't remember me, but I've met you before. Yeah, you were you were good friends with uh, Dr. Milligan. Oh, absolutely. Yes, Bruce Milligan. Yes. Yes. I uh, left high school. I was employed by Coral Mutual which was established in 1839. And part of my job was to inspect barns and other old buildings yeah. in the eastern part of Ontario. And I can remember looking at some of these farms and going back to the original registry of these farms. And they didn't have the exact location but I knew that some of the barns that I had seen were built way back before 1830. And it was really interesting. And what amazed me was the length of the trees or the beams. Now, I'm going by memory, but I remember outside of Lynn, we matured this one farm. And the beam, I was amazed. It was one tree, one tree. And I don't know why 75 feet hit me. Yeah. But I, I was amazed and it was you know, huge. Anyway, it, it was really interesting. And uh, the, the settlement of these farms out of nothing, it grew to magnificent buildings. So. I found that extremely interesting. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Well, I can tell you that uh, 
that's interesting that you're, you were involved in the insurance uh, industry because uh, that's one of the things that we struggle with right now is we don't believe farmers are have enough insurance on some of these old farms. They just don't have enough. And they get shocked when the barn burns down. Uh, the longest beam that I've seen in a barn is 66 feet long. I would bet that there are longer ones, so 75 is not crazy. And um, and the other thing is, uh, so in my next book, I'm including a, um, a barn, a swing beam barn that was up in eastern Ontario, up in uh, in old uh, Addington uh, Township uh, in the north um, Napanee area. And the Napanee, so the Napanee, I don't know what the insurance place is called there, but it's in Napanee. They have a brand new or renovated old feed uh, store that they have taken the parts from an old swing beam barn. They put the swing beam in the building and I'm going to include it in my next book. And I was just there a month ago. It's a remarkable, beautiful. And it would have been built in 1830s for sure. Um, Hugh, I decided to thank you in three parts given the presentation. All right. The first part is the content. Uh, you made something that's interesting, extremely interesting with your stories and pictures. So excellent presentation. The second part is enthusiasm. There's no question a, a speaker who understands and embraces and has energy can only do a superb talk. So the second one is thank you for your enthusiasm. The last one is sort of like a three, There's a, but it's a three zero. It's a $30 gift certificate from LCBO. And hopefully you can enjoy this, perhaps writing the next book. Well, I would be very pleased to use it. I'll just close with one story about that barn up there. In that area, they used to grow wheat, they used to grow wheat. But now, that back in the 1860s, they started growing barley. And you know why they grew barley? Beer. To make beer. And it was because of the Civil War. And the Americans had some kind of uh, tariff or something. And so they got their barley from Canada. And that's why all the farms all got filled up there for barley. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it.